Nina Mani, Nai Nari Candy, couldn't you turn Nai Walla in the morning? Nai Yatabu, Tinga Tikandi, Nai Tani, Nyanga Waplendi. I just said, hello, my name is Candy. That's my nickname. I'm the third born son of my family. Born in Wallaroo, live in the city of Adelaide and work around the city of Adelaide. It always was Ghana land, always will be. And I officially welcome you to Ghana country here today for this very important occasion because it's Aboriginal Leaders Forum number nine, which means later this year we'll have number 10 and it'll probably be the biggest and best one we've had. So Premier, you'll have to come back for that one. Before we get things underway, I'd like to um, mention that Professor Alex Brown from Wadla Paringa is unable to be here today, so we um, accept his apology. Now, I'd like to welcome the Premier, Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, Mr Stephen Marshall. Thanks, Clinton, and thank you for the welcome to country. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here um, today, and uh, this is, if you like, the first time that I've had an opportunity as the... Um, Premier responsible for Aboriginal Affairs to speak to Aboriginal leaders, so I'm really grateful for the opportunity that has been provided uh, to me this morning. I'd like to acknowledge every single person uh, in the room, quite frankly, because uh, you're all leaders in your area, but in particular I'd like to uh, acknowledge the Commissioner for Aboriginal Engagement, Harry Miller, and the Commissioner for Treaty, Roger Thomas, and the Commissioner for Mental Health uh, in South Australia, Chris Burns, and um, the Chair. Steve Tully and all of the board members, but really, quite frankly, every single person that is in the room. And also Nerida, of course, who is our head of art, who has to put up with me pretty much on a daily basis now. So I'd like to um, thank uh, everybody for the invitation to speak today. I'll be brief because I'd really like to give you the opportunity to ask any questions that you might have uh, of me. I understand, uh, as uh, uh, was pointed out by Candy, that this is the ninth uh, meeting. The role of the forum is to engage with leaders uh, in the Aboriginal community, Aboriginal people who are leaders in the health system to, number one, establish health priorities for Aboriginal communities across South Australia, and two, guide the Health Performance uh, Council in its monitoring and review of Aboriginal health status and performance measures in those areas where the health system is responding to the needs of Aboriginal people. The last uh, uh, forum was held in November last year, and I note from the, uh, the, the agenda in the minutes uh, that that was a meeting which um, the Commissioner Thomas uh, raised the issue uh, or addressed the issue of treaty. Um, and I thought before I get on to health related matters, I might just make a couple of comments uh, regarding treaty. Uh, as you'd be aware, the previous government had a process in place to uh, roll out a series of treaties or at least undertake some uh, negotiation with people about what those treaties could look like, whether they would be individual treaties or a statewide uh, treaty. Um, the former government formed the opinion that they would negotiate individual treaties. We made it clear in the lead up to the last election that we didn't think that this was uh, a key priority for us. We outlined some of our uh, priorities in the lead up to the election, but we said that uh, we wouldn't be proceeding with uh, 47 separate individual treaties as part of our uh, key priorities for Aboriginal affairs and reconciliation uh, following the election. Um, having said that, I am meeting with the Commissioner, I think, on Monday next week. Uh, so I apologise that it's taken so long to finally uh, get to have a chat. And uh, what the Commission has done is to pull together a lot of the learnings uh, from the work that was done last year. We uh, certainly don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think there's been some excellent work which has been done in that area. And what we want to do is to build on that. Mm -hmm. That's why we've made a couple of really um, big decisions already. The first is that um, I will take responsibility for Aboriginal affairs. I think giving Aboriginal affairs to a minister um, doesn't, necessarily, um, doesn't necessarily give them the clout in Cabinet to affect change across government and quite frankly um, the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs and Reconciliation has a very small team and has very little influence over the major areas of service delivery and that's why I think for us to really move forward uh, as we should then we need to make sure uh, that we have a whole of government uh, approach rather than just a single small uh, division. And that's why I thought the best um, way to deal with this would be for me to take responsibility because those cabinet ministers have to listen to me uh, if they want to keep their jobs. So uh, I thought that I could have uh, influence in developing a whole of state uh, approach. And that's something that I'll be talking about later in the year. 
The other major uh, move, of course, is that we've decided to move Aboriginal Affairs and Reconciliation Division back into the Department of Premier and Cabinet. I don't want to be too critical of the previous government. I know what their thinking was in terms of moving it into the Department of State Development because they wanted to have um, you know, a jobs focus, uh, which I think is uh, very important, don't get me wrong. But I do think that this is, one of, as I said, one of the key areas of public policy and I think that it is an area which uh, belongs in DPC and so we're affecting those changes at the moment and Aboriginal Affairs and Reconciliation Division will come back into the Premier's Department, I think, on the 1st of July is the date that all of these machinery of government um, changes uh, take uh, place. So look, hopefully that's, um, hopefully that is just gives you a little bit of background on um, the way that I'm thinking about this portfolio. Let's talk a little bit about some health issues because I'm sure that's the main reason why you're here this morning and then open up to some questions. I don't need to tell any of you that health, health outcomes for Aboriginal people are not at the level that anybody would want or expect or indeed tolerate. Um, Sure, the health of Aboriginal people is high on the agenda across Australia in the Commonwealth Government and at state government le level. It has been for some time. The Closing the Gap program was launched by the Australian Government back in 2008. So 10 years ago, they've had 10 years uh, to do with these issues. But the overall outlook for health of Aboriginal people in Australia and for us uh, here in South Australia, I believe, continues to be unacceptably poor. The Health Performance Council said uh, so in its uh, Aboriginal Health in South Australia 2017 case study. The Prime Minister acknowledged in his 2018 report on closing the gap that, and I'll quote, uh, we are having a continuing journey ahead of us. I think that's almost an understatement, isn't it, really? Uh, and that it was necessary to, and again I quote, maintain a long-term vision of what success looks like and importantly how success is defined by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people themselves. Look, we are not doing, uh, we're not doing a good enough job in this area. On average, Aboriginal people live shorter lives, child mortality is higher, anxiety, depression, heart disease, asthma, diabetes and kidney disease are all more commonly experienced. There is poor nutrition. Fruit and vegetable consumption by Aboriginal people is low and this is what the data tells us. Smoking too is more common for Aboriginal people. High blood pressure is prevalent. The data also clearly shows that Aboriginal people are underrepresented in our public health workforce. Today, the SA Health data shows that 417 of its 40,000 employees identify as Aboriginal. That's around 1%. And this data is skewed by the higher participation rate in country uh, health, which has 166, around one third uh, of those employees. This is a credit. Uh, to country health. I don't know whether there are people from country health uh, here today, but it is a credit to them um, that they're, um, they're getting closer to that 2% mark and we congratulate them for that. But more than half of South Australia's Aboriginal population lives in the metropolitan area where participation rates are, um, are considerably low, lower. In the central Adelaide uh, local health network, for instance, uh, has a, um, a participation rate of half of 1%. 71 employees, just 71 employees are identifying as Aboriginal out of a total workforce of 14,600. In 2015, less than three quarters of 1% of clinical and allied health professionals were Aboriginal people. That's less than a third of what it would be if the structure of health workforce were to match the population representation. We've got to do better uh, in this area. We also know that health is related to many wider social and economic measures. Aboriginal people in South Australia are imprisoned at 10 times the rate of non-Aboriginal people and so are facing further inequality in health access. Proportionally more Aboriginal children are under the guardianship of the minister or subject to care and protection orders. Violence and the threat of violence is high in many communities. Aboriginal people are twice as likely as the average uh, South Australian to have experienced homelessness and three times as likely to be living in overcrowded housing. Unemployment too is disproportionately high, four times the overall unemployment rate here in South Australia. We know these are all factors that contribute to poorer health and wellbeing outcomes. But the data does show some bright spots. Aboriginal people continue to be supported by strong cultural and community ties. A higher proportion are now engaged in physical activity. Some alcohol risk measures look better on average than for non-Aboriginal people in South Australia. 
childhood immunisation rates are good, better in fact, than for non-Aboriginal uh, people. Another recent uh, piece of good news was the announcement by the Federal Government of funding for the Purple House providing renal dialysis on the APY lands. This is a service run by uh, the Anangu for uh, the Anangu and I welcome the support of the Federal Government and certainly from our perspective in the State Government we spoke about this in the lead up to the election trying to do all that we could to support it, especially with some transitional funding as they move towards uh, a fair uh, price set by uh, the Federal Government for that, um, that um, that service that is provided. So there is some good news, but the bright spots are clearly not enough. A good analysis of Aboriginal health outcomes needs good data. There are deficiencies in how much useful data is collected and also its quality. Sometimes statisticians and researchers have to make inferences from national data only, making it so much harder to know where we are starting from in South Australia and where we are making a difference. The new Chief Executive of SA Health has made clear in his introduction to staff that this is a priority, and a priority of the Minister for Health and Wellbeing, the Honourable Stephen Wade, to improve collection, capture and access to important health data. More high quality data will be necessary to know how well programs are being implemented, whether aspirations to do better are being achieved, and to qualify the tangible benefits to Aboriginal communities. But in the end, Data and the analysis of data is only the starting point, driving accountability for investments into community instead of just into government and helping our state to move from a practice of identifying shortcomings to actually measuring successes. In conclusion, progress will come not just from the government but also from you, the leaders of the Aboriginal communities in South Australia. What is important is working together to invest in cohesive community solutions an Aboriginal-led approach, working across disciplines and across government portfolios. We must take account of the social, cultural, spiritual, economic and environmental determinants, sorry, such as health, employment, safe housing and culturally appropriate health promotion and health practices. That is why ensuring right across government we have the right programs and priorities uh, in place and that we make sure that we maintain them. I thank you for this opportunity to outline some of the direction that the government wants to take in health and Aboriginal affairs and I look forward to being able to participate in future meetings in this important forum.